We finally have our solar installed and it's awesome. It is, it's super exciting to finally have this project done. Today we're gonna to tell you all about the project and how we did it. This is not a how-to video. We just want to put that out there now. This is a how we did it video. By we, I mean him, of course. <laughs> I'm just here to maybe ask some questions that some of you might have. Yeah, this is a super complex topic, so we're not going to go way into the weeds on it, but we will have time indexes below to each section in case you want to skip ahead. Before you attempt any kind of DIY project with this type of wiring and complexity, be very familiar with what you're doing. Be familiar with Ohm's law and Watt's law and how to convert them and what all that means. You gotta know all that stuff. If you're unfamiliar or this seems very overwhelming to you, if you saw our video about the NRVTA, you know that we highly recommend their courses and they actually have a solar course too. Mm -hmm. So that would be a great place to start before you attempt doing this yourself. Yeah, and the fundamentals course is also a good prerequisite to that. They don't require it, but the first two days of the fundamentals goes over RV electricity and gets you comfortable with all the things I just talked about, Ohm's law, Watt's law, all that good stuff. I did not take the solar course at NRVTA, even though I think it would be great. I have a background in electronics and electricity and everything with the Navy. I did find a really good book. If you're already comfortable with the fundamentals of electricity and RV electricity, Will Prouse, who has a YouTube channel also that's very solar related. I think it's actually a solar channel. <laughs> He has written a great book that I read and it is really great and takes you through the basics and lets you build on that. I'll have a link for that below as well. We're probably going to have to take this topic and make it into multiple videos because it is so complex and there's a lot going on. This one is our install primarily and then we will have some videos down the line about how it's doing and us actually working and living with the solar. Yeah, the install itself took me nine days. Nine times. Nine times. So this could be a little bit of a long video, but like we mentioned, we will have time indexes to get you to the part that you're looking for. None of these products are sponsored or given to us for promotion or for us to talk about them. We did pay for everything ourselves, and we do that because we like to really be able to get a good feel for it on our own time and do our own thing with it. Right, so. and not be obligated to a bunch of different things because solar takes a lot of stuff from a lot of different places. We do have some partnerships involved in this where we have affiliate codes for the batteries and things like that, and we'll have those links below. Hold on, I think Daisy's gotta go outside. You're in good hands with him. I'm gonna get her. Oh, going outside. Oh boy, I'll be back. You don't need me for this anyhow. Before we jump into our installation, I wanna cover just a few basics to have a baseline on which to build some of the solar stuff. An RV has actually three electrical systems. Two of them are for the actual house, DC and AC. The third one is DC for your tow vehicle or the coach side of your class A. We're only gonna be worried about the AC and DC systems that are in an RV. And that is the big difference. RVs have AC and DC systems. Unlike your house, which is gonna be just 120 volts AC, you plug stuff into the walls and that's pretty much it. RVs have batteries so you can run off grid. Those batteries are your 12 volt system and that will be used to do things like power your lights, power some of your control panels for your fridge and things like that. It powers the motor on your furnace. There are a lot of things that are direct DC powered in an RV. Your hydraulic jacks are a good example of that. Your awnings, a lot of those small motor type of devices are gonna be DC powered. And just like in a house, your 120 volt system are gonna be things that you plug in. Coffee pot, TV, the air conditioning, all of these high wattage things are usually going to be on your 120 volt side. Microwave is a good example. On that AC 120 volt side of the equation, RVs do have two different flavors of that as well. You have a 30 amp system, which is a single hot leg providing 30 amps, or you have a 50 amp system, which is actually two 50 amp hot legs providing a total of 100 amps. I'm not gonna dig deep into that because it really doesn't matter that much when it comes to solar and how it interacts, but you should know that. These two AC and DC systems 
are pretty much on their own and isolated, but they do have to be connected in some way so they can make use of each other. The most basic way is a converter. Our RV came with a converter and all that thing does is it converts AC to DC. It's made to charge your batteries and or supply some DC power for loads while you're actually running. The other type is an inverter. An inverter goes the opposite way. It takes your DC power and turns it into AC power so you can run things like your microwave and your fridge and all that good stuff off of your batteries. Typically an inverter is also a charger so it can actually go both directions. It can charge your batteries or it can be draining your batteries to supply AC power. It can do it either direction. What you can actually run on the AC side via your inverter depends on two things. The capacity of that inverter, how many watts it can provide, and that determines what it can power. That's pretty straightforward. The other thing is how it's wired. If your inverter came with your RV, there's a good chance that your AC systems aren't hooked up to it, and maybe not even all of your outlets. So how it's wired into your system makes a big difference. Our system is designed so that it powers everything all the time. Obviously, we can't run everything at the same time, but it's there and powered if we want to run it. We do have a separate inverter video, so I refer you to that for any more details on inverters. As we go through this discussion, I'm gonna to try to stick to watts and watt hours. A watt is basically a measure of energy. And the reason I'm gonna be using that versus voltage and amps and things like that is because watts are watts. Whether you're talking about DC watts or AC watts, they're kind of the same, so you don't really have to do a lot of conversion other than the energy lost across the inverter. Another convenience there is that most of your appliance do list their energy consumption in watts, so it makes it much easier to figure out what you need. So watts versus watt hours. All you're talking about in watt hours is how long you're running something. So a 100 watt light bulb run for two hours is 200 watt hours. You ran 100 watts for two hours. So when you're talking about watt hours, it's kind of like your power bill, right? You pay for your power bill in kilowatt hours, which is just thousands of watt hours. It's a way of measuring energy over time. So when you talk about sizing a battery bank, we're gonna be talking about watt hours. So let's jump into a little bit of an intro on solar. Solar as a concept is really pretty simple. You've got panels on your roof that take light from the sun and turn it into DC voltage. So you're getting DC power from the panels when the sun is out. That's the basic simplified version of it. Just like your converter can charge your batteries and your inverter charger can charge your batteries, solar also charges your batteries and also can supply some runtime load depending on how much you're using versus how much you're getting from solar. But that's really all solar is. It's just another way to charge your batteries, but it's free and it's from the sun and you can do it anywhere you have sunlight, which is really cool. I'm gonna to touch briefly on planning solar because again, that by itself is a very complex topic. Again, that book by Will Prowse has a really good section on that. But the general idea is to basically look at your usage and what you wanna be able to run off of your batteries and then plan based on that. So you take the wattage from your microwave, from your air conditioner, from your coffee pot, you figure out how long you're gonna run those on a given day Add all that up and you'll come up with a watt hour number. And then you want to look at your battery bank and size your batteries, double that. That way if you have a rainy day, you can go for a couple days running off your batteries. That's the battery side of a solar installation because a solar setup is really useless without a way to store that energy to run things at night or on a rainy day. Also when you're planning your battery bank for solar, you want to keep in mind the type of battery. We covered this a little bit in our mooch stocking video, but there's lots of different types of batteries out there. You've got AGM, flooded cell, you've got all kinds of different flooded cell varieties. The thing about those is most of them can only be discharged to 50%. So even if you have a 100 amp hour flooded cell battery, it's really only good for 50 amp hours. Whereas lithium, those things can be drained to 100% and a 100 amp hour battery is 100 amp hours. So be aware of that when you're planning out your battery bank. When it comes to planning the solar side of your solar system, the actual panels and controllers and things like that, you want to size that based on the charge capacity of your batteries. You basically want to have as much solar as you can fit on your roof, but you don't want to overdo it and supply more power than your batteries can handle. If your batteries can only handle 100 amps of charge, having a solar system that gives you 150, 200 amps is just wasted. It's not going to do you any good. 
for us, it was no big deal because we have a large, large battery bank and we would never be able to put enough solar panels on our roof to overcome the charge capacity of our batteries. One of our main goals with our solar install and our battery bank upgrades was to be able to run our air conditioning when we're boondocking. We want to be able to run it at night and have it run all night. So we're looking at a probably roughly six hours of actual runtime because it turns off and on, that kind of thing. Our AC is about a 1600 watt system. So if you just figure an average of six hours a night, we're looking at about 9600 watt hours to run our AC for six hours. We also have to factor in the fact that we're going to lose about 10% of our power converting it from DC to AC. You're going to lose about 10% average. You're looking at about 10,500 watt hours. When I was sizing our battery bank, I kind of did it based on what I could fit there. Turns out they match up pretty well. We have 10 100 amp hour 12 volt batteries from Battleborn, and that calculates to 12,000 watt hours. Again, I'm not going to go into the math on all that, but 12,000 is bigger than 10,500, so we have enough batteries. And then again, that's just a very rough example. We're going to be running other things, you know, our computers, our TVs, things like that. But 10 batteries was all I could fit up there. Plus, they are super expensive. So again, that factors in as well. We went with Battleborn batteries simply because we already had three of them and they have been rock solid. You know, aside from wiring them improperly, you just can't mess them up. Their BMS is top notch. It protects the battery from any kind of unsafe conditions like overheating, overcharging. They have a hundred amp continuous current each. So we have a ton of current available. They also do have a 200 amp surge current and they have a 10 year warranty. So they stand behind their product. They're a really, really solid player in the lithium ion game. And we've been really happy with them. We do have affiliate links below. We'd love it if you'd use our links. With our 10 Battleborn batteries in parallel, we're looking at 100 amps per battery charge capacity. In parallel, that means we have a thousand amps of charge capacity which really means we could probably fit a 20, 30, 40 panels and plug it in and it'd be fine because we can handle a thousand amps of charging. So with our solar setup, it really comes down to how many panels can I fit on the roof and then how to wire those. So with all of that kind of prerequisite baseline out of the way, let's jump into our setup. First of all, you know that I like to do projects myself, which means I like to break the projects into small chunks that don't disrupt our lives. I think the planning process for all of this is probably one of the most confusing parts because you kind of have to design your overall system ahead of time and think about where you're going to put things, how big they are, how, what kind of wiring you're going to need, the types of fuses and breakers. You got to get all of that kind of out of the way ahead of time so you can order the right parts and get them all in. Guaranteed you'll forget something. This is our wiring diagram and it's going to be a lot to look at at first, but we're going to cover each section as I did it. So if you look here, I've got this split into two sides. All of the DC stuff is over here. All of the AC stuff is over here. And you can see how they're connected right in the middle here by the inverter charger. Also in part of the planning process, I wanted parts that all kind of worked together. I know Victron is really good about that. So that was the way I went was with the Victron controllers. And you'll see how I got those wired once I get to that point. But first let's talk about panels. I did a little bit of research to try to find some kind of new inventive cutting edge panel that was better than the rest. Quite honestly, most of them are about the same. We've got several friends who use high tech 200 watt solar panels. So I decided, well, that's what I'll do. That seems to be kind of the top end of that form factor of solar panels at 200 watts. Initially, I had planned on upgrading the batteries first in this step stage process. But while we were at the NRBTA training, I saw that Todd had a whole pallet full of panels of this exact same brand. So I asked him, can I buy these panels from you? He said, sure. So that's what I did. It was super convenient because that's one of the big problems too, was just the logistics of getting the panels. So the first step was trying to figure out how many panels can I use? So what I did was I took a piece of cardboard and I cut it to the size of a panel. I taped off the edges. I went on the roof. I taped it into a spot where I knew one panel could go. I took the drone up, I took some pictures, and then I just copied and pasted that little square all over the roof to figure out where I could put out panels. That worked out to be pretty good. I also didn't want to have our roof just completely jam-packed with no walking room. So I spaced them out so I had at least a foot between each panel to get to the sides. And I came up with a pretty comfortable placement for 10 panels. 
I was pondering how I'm going to get these solar panels on the roof and lo and behold Roger comes by who's like seven feet tall <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's just going to hand them to me on the roof so this should be short work of getting them up there and then I can bolt them down by the way Roger and his wife have a YouTube channel and social media presence tall and short travelers or is it short and tall it's the tall and short tall and short yeah. I'll give you one guess which one he is Tall or short. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, I hope you're the tall one. <laughs> yeah. I'm good for handing solar panels to Chad on the roof or getting tall things off the shelf at the grocery store. <laughs> you do have plenty of room up here. Oh yeah. My plan is to wire these five in series and then those five wrapped around in series you'll see that the access port is right between the two right there i have no idea where that goes but i'm going to find out nice now all i got to do is bring brackets up here and do them one at a time awesome it's gonna be sweet i decided that with 10 panels i would do two strings of five panels in series a couple of reasons behind that each of these panels provides about 24 volts at around 10 amps. So if I put five of them in series, I'm looking at about 120 volts at 10 amps. When you wire something in series, the voltage adds up and the current stays the same. That's a huge advantage on the roof because the lower the amperage means the smaller the wire, which means the easier it is to run. So you want to run as many in series as you can and still get away with it. I can't do all 10 in series because then we're looking at 240 volts at 10 amps and there aren't any controllers out there, at least none that are reasonable, that can handle 100, uh, 240 volts. With two strings of five, I'm looking at about 120 volts at 10 amps, which means I could use something like eight gauge wire up there and I can use two controllers that can each handle the 120 volts. I also now have to figure out what that means on the output side. Since I know that I'm gonna be converting it to 12 volts, I have to look at, okay, I've got 120 volts at 10 amps, that's 1200 watts. When I break that down on the current side on DC, it's 1200 watts divided by 12 gives me 100 amps. So I know that I need a controller that can handle up to 120 volts in and give me about 100 amps out. Victron has a 150 slash 100 that fit the bill perfectly. So I needed two of those and that's how I ended up wiring these in. I decided to use some sealant that Todd recommended. That's a special non-shrinking sealant, so it's not like Dicor that shrinks. What I did is I put that underneath the feet, and then I screwed through those, through the sealant, and then I put some Eternabond tape on top. This is fine for TPO roofs, but it does not shrink, but it's also not self-leveling. So I'll have to smooth that out a bit, but this should be good for what I'm doing there where I'm taking these screws into our roof. I gotta consider where I want my walking space up here. Obviously, I can get around this way really easily. It's not a big deal. I can always step in between here and still reach here if I need to. It's better to have some stepping space here than on that side, I think. So I think I'm gonna go with the line I've got here. Rather than do a panel at a time, I'm gonna prep each one with the brackets first then come back that way i'm not dealing with the uh, caulk gun priming and depriming and all that stuff step one is to put feet on each panel i don't know how well this audio is going to come out with the drone up there I was going to wait and do all this wiring later, but since I'm wiring these in series, I can go ahead and get all of my negative to negatives going down the line and get those connected while I can still turn the panels over. Luckily, Todd also has some good eight gauge outdoor wiring and MC4 connectors so I could finish up the wiring on top. MC4 connectors are basically just waterproof connectors. They usually come pre-attached, pre-wired to your solar panels. So it's just a matter of when you're connecting solar panels together, you can connect one side and then you have to make a wire for the other side, the negative side of it. MC4 connectors are super easy. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail there because there are plenty of videos out there on how to crimp and make MC4 connectors. Time to start sealing, screwing, sealing. 
That's all I'm going to do is I'm going to lift these panels up and then seal the squares underneath over there, seal on the deck here, lay them down on top of the sealant, and then just put screws in. Day three was basically making those wires, getting them bolted down. I wasn't going to worry about putting the wiring anywhere. I just zip tied the cables together with a zip lock over it, secured them up real good with Gorilla Tape, taped it to the roof, and considered the panels done and ready to connect. With the panels done and out of the way, the next step was the batteries. This was a little bit more complicated logistically because I wanted to keep everything in that front bay if possible. If you've seen our videos, you know we have slide trays and everything's kind of just perfect in our basement and I didn't want to mess that up by stacking batteries and stuff in there. The biggest problem was just having to move everything around in there. To put the batteries on top of the generator, of course, I've got to get the inverter off of there. And where am I going to put that? I decided I was going to put it up. So all I did with our inverter, I didn't even unhook it from AC. I just unmounted it, flipped it, and mounted it to the ceiling. That was an entire day process. That inverter is heavy and there's not room for more than one person in there. So what I ended up doing was building a ratchet system and I put ratchet straps around the frame and I cranked it, cranked it, cranked it, cranked it, cranked it until I got it up where I wanted. The other thing that I had to overcome was how to mount it to the frame up there. The inverter was just a little bit too narrow. It didn't reach both beams of the frame. So I used half inch aluminum squares to mount the inverter to that and then mount that to the frame. Worked out great, but it was a huge, huge pain. It took me a whole day just to get the inverter off and crank it up. So that takes us through project day four. Project day five was to finish mounting the inverter underneath and start on my battery wiring. I decided to use two by fours just like I did with the inverter on top of the generator compartment. This basically distributes the load of the batteries across the whole compartment to the edges. That way we're not looking at you know, anything sagging and bowing on top of the generator. It's using the sides as weight versus the top. So I just needed some extra boards. I had two runs. I needed two more runs for the batteries. So day five was just basically building all my interconnects. And again, that's part of the equation here is you got to figure out how you're going to connect your batteries together, how you're going to connect your batteries to your systems. I'm going to need four interconnects times two. I'm going to need eight interconnects. I'm going to have two rows of these. And then I'm going to need eight of the red also. So time to make 16 cables. And then of course I'll need the interconnects going this way. All that has to be taken into account, heat shrink, crimper, lugs. There's a lot to do in this project. looks good to me. You can see what I mean by the welding cable. Super fine strands. Okay, now I need seven more like that. I've got my eight interconnects done. Now I gotta do eight red ones, but I've got one more black cable to make to run the two strings of five in parallel. I will need to go here to here and here to here. Black to black, red to red. Positive to positive is parallel. For this one, I am going to take into account the bend and twist. These pieces of wood here, they go from edge to edge on the top edge of the generator box so it helps distribute that weight all the way across. Day five finished with me basically starting the install of those batteries and getting them laid out. I got a little bit overzealous when I was attaching my interconnects and I had two ratchets going like this and that heated up the bolt so much that I seized up two of them and ended up having to cut them off with a Dremel tool. Take it easy, don't get too crazy with the thing and make it hot and seize it like I did. No, it didn't get cross-threaded, it just seized. So I had to go to the hardware store, get some new bolts and 
lock nuts, and handy dandy Dremel tool, gonna cut that sucker off. Dribble tool wins the most valuable tool for 2021, for sure. Day six, I disconnected our three batteries. I moved them up to the top, got everything finished wiring up there, connect our inverter, basically got our thousand amp hour battery bank installed and completed. Before I go making new runs to the battery bank, I'm gonna wanna reorganize some of this here to make some more room for the charge controllers up there. So I want to try to get everything down to this level and I need to actually go look up the dimensions on those charge controllers and see what we got there. This project, I'm going over nine days of work, but it spanned about a month, which actually I got it done faster than I thought I was going to. So at this point, I got the solar panels on the roof. I got the batteries down here. I got to connect them together and here's where more problems ensue. Project day seven, I planned on basically putting my junction box on the roof and getting all of my wiring down into the front bay where all the batteries are. A problem I ran into is these RVs have a conduit, which is really awesome. They give you a little panel on the roof that's designed for solar that you can run your wiring down through the conduit into the bay. So that means getting this stuff here into here. So I have a little box here, the bottom cut out, that I can run two into this side and two into this side. But my first goal is to just see what's under this sealant here and how this panel connects to the inside. So it's just a little slit in insulation and I'm gonna have to cut this out and kind of dig around down there and see what we got. After I move the insulation out of the way, you can see it's just wood. This is the ducting, I think. And we've got some, looks like some, probably some DC control cabling here. I'll be careful of that. And it looks like there's also, there's a blue piece of PEX there. I'm not really sure where that goes. This PEX is supposedly my conduit to run lines through. I think I need to go inside and see exactly where this might come out because I'm literally right over our bedroom right now. So I'm not sure where this line goes. The trouble I ran into is the little sticky piece of thing that says solar goes here inside the basement was about that far off. And not only that, our conduit came down straight over the top of our furnace ducting. This actually took a couple of days to figure out because when I first went up there and tried to figure out where the thing was going, I couldn't find it. I couldn't figure out where this thing was terminating. I was trying to drill holes and do all kinds of stuff. I went online to the 397 forum on Facebook, got some feedback there, and everything that I saw looked like it must be terminating above the furnace duct. But I eventually went with it and I had to cut a flap into our duct. So I'm sure you can see here, there's my conduit hole right there. Opened it up and sure enough, there it was. So that was a day just figuring that out. The next day I decided to wire it. Here's our fish tape. Come right down. Get a couple of runs of this 10-2. 10-2 just means it's a 10 gauge, two wires. Attach it to the fish tape and run it back up. So I disconnected this side of the run here. That way that circuit is open and it won't provide voltage. I'm gonna get my multimeter though and double check. Day eight was all about getting the wiring from the roof to the front bay. Now, a lot of RV solar installs, you will see a junction box on the roof where some people will put actual bus bars in there and bridge them in. Panels are in series and they wire them together in parallel in the junction box. We couldn't do that because we just have too many panels to wire all into one bundle, whether it's a co any combination of series parallel, we were gonna end up with too much voltage or too much amperage, so we had to split it out. So my wiring from the junction box down is just splices and it's straight in, straight to the front bay. The top wiring is done. This is it. I've got negative, positive, you can see black and red, negative, positive, 
black and red. Double strain relief on these, they're nice and snug. I'll just put the cap on here, reconnect my wires up here, then go test my voltage downstairs. What I ended up doing was, since that ducting from the roof terminated underneath the furnace vent, I just ran the remainder of the cable forward into the furnace vent that just terminates there anyway. And then I just cut a hole through that, went out, and then through the wall that goes into the front bay. So day nine, time for the final wiring. I used the same tactic that I did on the roof, which is to cut out some pieces of cardboard. I cut out some for the controllers. I cut out some for the fuse boxes and everything I wanted to put in there stuck them to the wall using that two-sided magic tape, got everything laid out, figured out where I was gonna put everything. And that leaves this space here for my DC wiring for the inverter. And then it was just a matter of screwing them into the walls, mounting and wiring. You can see now I have all of the wiring done from the charge controllers. The negatives go down to the bus bars. Positives go through two different breakers and to the positive side. And then I'm going to power on the uh, charge controllers and see if I can see them in the app. PV cables coming from the roof through two separate 15 amp breakers. The breakers are sized for the wire, not the panels. The panels only put out about 10 amps, but those are the shutoffs. Those come down and into each controller to the PV input. So everything's switched off right now. All I've got left is to put on my bus bar covers and connect the solar up top and turn them on, see what happens. Also, while I was in there, I wired in a new shunt. Why did I change shunts? Because I busted the crap out of the first one. If you watched our battery management video, you know we used to have a BMV 712. That is a shunted battery monitor. And a shunted battery monitor is the only way to truly manage and, and monitor your state of charge on batteries. Everything else uses voltage and it's very inaccurate. You'll see these charts of this voltage equals this percent, and this voltage equals this percent for this type of battery. Well, that's all great as long as you're measuring the voltage with no load. As soon as you apply a load to the system, the voltage drops and all that's out the window. So it's really difficult. A shunted battery monitor is the way to go. So when I ordered a replacement for our BMB 712, Victron had to come out with a new thing called a smart shunt. It's just like the 712, except all of the logic and everything is, is built right into it and Bluetooth is built right into it also. So the disadvantage is I don't have my functioning monitor in my cabinet up here anymore. The upside is I can use my phone. The smart controllers also have Bluetooth. So that's one of the reasons I liked Victron and I went with Victron is connecting to them over Bluetooth with the app is super easy. Upgrading the firmware on these things through the app over Bluetooth, super easy. In fact, it requires you to do it when you first install it. The other reason I liked it is because they are all considered smart. They use the new VE smart networking, which means they can all talk to each other and get data and act appropriately. The reason that's important is particularly when you have two charge controllers, they need to know about each other. They need to know that, oh, hey, I'm reading a lot of voltage on here, but that's coming from this charge controller. So I either do or don't need to supply some wattage there. Those need to talk to each other so they communicate they also talk to the smart shunt. So the two controllers and the smart shunt all work together as a harmonious system. So you might wonder about the inverter and the inverter charging along with the controllers charging. And you're right, that can cause not problems, but it might just confuse things. What I do is I just let solar charge the batteries now completely. I turned our charger on our inverter off because we're always getting plenty of voltage from the sun to charge the batteries and I don't need those two things competing. I do plan on upgrading to a Victron inverter soon. We'll talk about that in a minute. But once I got everything wired up, I was pretty impressed with how easy it was. I fired up the Victron Connect app. It found the controllers. As soon as I clicked on it, it said you got to upgrade the firmware. It did it. Then I was able to plug in my parameters from Battleborn 
Whenever you're configuring something that charges batteries and you want to know what settings to use, go to the battery manufacturer, not the manufacturer of the thing that's doing the charging. It's the same thing for the inverter charger charging the batteries. It's the same thing for the charge controllers charging the batteries. So I plugged in all the settings and it just worked. I was amazed, super excited. All right, zero watts, but let me flip my breakers for the PV while we still got some sunlight. Ah, now I'm seeing 114 volts on solar. And here it goes, here it goes. It is cranking it up. With that all said and done and everything running, I just kind of want to cover this wiring diagram just a little bit so you can see what the current state is, how it's all wired together, and how all these pieces work together. So we're going to start down here in the bottom right. And this is our DC system. I have a one Battleborn battery sitting here in the picture, but it's really 10. So we have 10 times 100 amp hours of Battleborn as a battery bank. That connects to bus bars. Bus bars make it super simple to get everything off of your battery terminals, which you need to do if you're ever going to use a shunt anyway. For a shunt to work, everything has to go through it. That means nothing can bypass it and connect directly to your batteries. Bus bars are a great way to accomplish that and also give you the added lugs and things to connect to. So you can see right here, this is the smart shunt. That is the thing that watches all traffic in and out of the battery bank to give me a true state of charge. It'll actually tell me you've used this many amp hours and you have this many amp hours left. And based on how much you're using, this is how long your batteries are going to last, which is super helpful. Over here, you'll see I have a master cutoff. This is a master cutoff for the batteries completely to the entire RV, the inverter, the lights, everything. If I want to shut off DC power, I have that master cutoff. Now your RV might have a master switch also, but I will bet it doesn't shut off everything. So if you're going to be storing your RV, it's a good idea to have a master cutoff or just remove your positive battery lead from your battery. Up here in the top right, is the solar. You'll notice that it wires into these same bus bars right here, just like the inverter, just like the batteries. It's just one more source of DC power. But let's talk about that source of DC power. Up on the roof, we have 10 panels, two strings of five panels each of 200 watts for a total of 1,000 watts per string. Those come straight down into the front bay, go through, some 15 amp breakers. Again, I size the breakers to the wire, even though those panels are only gonna supply about 10 amps. The big thing was I couldn't find 10 amp breakers. I knew the wire could handle 15 amps, and that's the main thing is you wanna protect the wiring. So right here, I've got 100 volts coming in to each controller at about 10 amps. Coming out of the controller, Again, through another breaker, because we're changing the size of our wires, we're changing the size of that circuit. Every circuit needs its own breaker. And that's it. Those things supply DC power to the bus bars, which supplies power to our system and to the inverter, to the batteries. And that's where a lot of confusion comes in on solar is what can I run on solar? Well, nothing technically runs on solar, but it does kind of, it's a bit confusing. So let's look at a scenario here. Let's say we're drawing 200 amps. Let's just use wattage. Let's say we're drawing 2000 watts. That 2000 watts is gonna be a mixture of power from the batteries and power from the solar panels. They're both supplying juice. They're both supplying potential energy in the form of voltage to this DC system. And then the DC system is just gonna take it wherever it can get it. Now the solar panels, again, they talk to each other. They know about how much is being drawn. They know how much they're providing. The biggest thing is they know the voltage of the system and whether or not they even need to provide anything. Right now we're sitting here on shore power. The solar panels are getting juice, but it's not really supplying a lot of energy to our system because we just don't need it. That's what the controllers do. If I were to unplug shore power and start using the inverter, the charge controllers would ramp up if they can, if the sun's there, and supply that extra power. A quick note on our inverter, because a lot of you have asked about the new Victron MultiPlus 2 2X120. It's a long name. But there is a new inverter by Victron that is much like its previous MultiPlus, but this one has the full 50 amp pass through, meaning it's got two hots in and two hots out, just like our Go Power. Supposedly, the new Victron MultiPlus 2 2X120 
will actually do power share on both lines. I'm not really sure about that, but the main reason I want to go with it is because of its interoperability with the other systems in the VE smart network and the fact that the controllers talk to each other and the shunt and now the inverter can also. So if we do that, we'll have a separate video and we'll talk all about that, the pros and cons. We'll make separate videos on the usage of the system and boondocking and how well they work, but a few quick observations from just the short time that we've had the solar installed. We like to run our fridge off of AC power versus propane when we travel. You know, there's a whole other discussion about whether or not you should run your fridge on propane. Sometimes it's your only option to keep your food safe. So we like to run our fridge over the inverter while we travel. The problem we had is those three batteries just couldn't last long enough. They would last about five hours with the draw from the fridge because these aren't real efficient. Now that meant that when we would stop for lunch, we would run the generator, which is good. We want to exercise the generator anyway. We would use that to charge the batteries back up and turn the AC on and things like that so that we could continue our travel day and not have to turn on propane. Now we don't have to worry about that for two reasons. A, we've got a thousand amp hours. We could go for days now and not have to really worry about it. Also, with the solar while we're driving down the road, the batteries never get discharged. I mean, they just don't. So really, we could have solved that problem with just solar or just batteries, but our goal is to be able to run the AC and things like that for boondocking. But we have been able to now stop for our lunches and things like that and run our AC, run the microwave, run the fridge. We do all this now without even starting our generator, which is really super cool. The other thing we've been doing is in the heat of the summer, we used to stop in a rest area maybe an hour before our destination and turn on the generator and turn on the ACs. No need for that now. We just turn on the AC and let it run. Granted, we can only run one AC. It's a 3000 watt inverter and a 1600 watt AC unit. So you can see why, you know, when we've got 15 or 1600 watt loads, you can only run one of them. There are going to be other draws on the system from you know, the microwave, our computers, our networking equipment, and things like that. If we wanted to run two ACs, we would need two inverters, which is doable. You can put an inverter on each line of your 50 amp legs. We do have some plans this summer to go boondocking in places that aren't 110 degrees. We like to be able to get by on one AC when we boondock, because now we can run it via the inverter. So that's the whole point of this whole upgrade was to have that power and be able to boondock for several days or weeks without having to use any kind of generator. We will try that. We'll let you know how it goes. We don't know yet because we haven't done it, but be sure to stay tuned. Be sure to subscribe. Click the like button if you haven't already. And that's it. If you have any questions, put them down below and we'll try to get it to them.